There was a time when the story of modern humans seemed deceptively simple. We were taught that Homo sapiens evolved in Africa, perfected their tools and culture in isolation, and then, only once prepared, swept across the globe in a great migration about 50,000 years ago, replacing other hominin species along the way. The Neanderthals, so the story went, were mere footnotes in our triumphal expansion. But what if this version of our origins is not only incomplete, but fundamentally flawed? The new study led by Professor Joshua Akey at Princeton University is not merely adding footnotes to the human story. It is rewriting its central chapters. With the aid of sophisticated genomic tools and artificial intelligence, Akey and his team have revealed a history that is not about replacement, but about relationship. Their research shows that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals interacted in multiple waves going back as far as 250,000 years, and that these interactions were not confined to a single dispersal event, but were part of a long, complex and dynamic web of contact. These findings directly challenge the replacement model, once the dominant theory in paleoanthropology, and offer compelling support for what has long been the underdog in this debate, the assimilation model. If we colonized the world, it must have been because we were in some way better than the others. This idea of the replacement uh, model. People come out of Africa and they replace the Neanderthals. It could be in an active way. At one point, people thought it was a kind of genocide or through competition. But whatever way, it had to be because we replaced the others. For decades, the replacement model reigned supreme. It proposed that modern humans emerged in Africa and remained there, isolated and genetically distinct until they finally left the continent around 50,000 years ago. Once outside Africa, they are said to have replaced archaic humans like Neanderthals with little or no interbreeding. This clean and linear model suited a world that preferred tidy origins. But real evolution, as it turns out, is far messier. Joshua Akey's team, working with ancient genomes from three Neanderthals and one Denisovan, and comparing them with data from 2,000 living humans, used a machine learning algorithm to detect patterns of genetic exchange invisible to older methods. What they discovered is nothing short of revolutionary. Modern humans had not waited patiently in Africa before venturing forth, but had been on the move almost immediately after their emergence, dispersing and mixing with Neanderthals multiple times over a span of more than 200,000 years. Of course, all of these hominin groups are human, but to avoid saying Neanderthal humans, Denisovan humans, and ancient versions of our own kind of humans, most archaeologists and anthropologists use the shorthand Neanderthals, Denisovans, and modern humans to keep it simple. If modern humans were interacting with Neanderthals as early as 250,000 years ago, then they must have been living near Neanderthals, certainly not confined to sub-Saharan Africa. This revelation places the stage for early Homo sapiens, not in isolation, but in borderlands, regions like Southwest Asia where geographic proximity to Neanderthals allowed for frequent genetic and cultural exchange. These interactions were not one-off flukes, but recurring and meaningful, shaping both species over time. That contrasts sharply with previous genetic data. To date, most genetic data suggests that modern humans evolved in Africa 250,000 years ago, stayed put for the next 200,000 years, and then decided to disperse out of Africa 50,000 years ago and go on to people the rest of the world, Aki said in a statement. The implications are profound. If Homo sapiens left Africa in waves starting around 250,000 years ago, it upends the idea of a single out-of-Africa event. Instead of a clean break, what we have is a mosaic of migrations, returns, and local interactions. As Aki put it, there wasn't a long period of stasis. Shortly after modern humans arose, we've been migrating out of Africa and coming back to Africa too. This dynamic model of dispersal paints Homo sapiens as restless travelers rather than isolated innovators. And it positions Southwest Asia as a crucial crucible of human evolution, not merely a waypoint on the road to Europe or Asia, but a shared homeland of hybrid humanity. To underscore the significance of this, the research team did something new. Instead of only asking what Neanderthal genes are doing in us, they asked what our genes were doing in Neanderthals. In the Neanderthal genome, they found evidence of modern human DNA 
dating back to early interbreeding events, long before the famous 50,000-year-old dispersal. These genes would not have come from the so-called final wave of modern humans, but from much earlier populations, people who lived and stayed in contact zones alongside Neanderthals. And because these genes were found in Neanderthals rather than modern humans, they suggest that some offspring of these unions remained with Neanderthal communities and were lost to our direct lineage, further complicating the tale of separation and replacement. If the replacement model depended on the notion that Homo sapiens evolved in isolation, the evidence now demonstrates that isolation was never truly the case. Contact and exchange were not peripheral. They were central. The genetic traces prove that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens shared more than territory. They shared DNA, behaviors, and likely culture. Rather than replacing Neanderthals outright, modern humans slowly interbred with and absorbed them over tens of thousands of years. This is precisely the vision articulated by the assimilation model, first proposed in 1989 by anthropologist Fred Smith. According to this model, Homo sapiens did not simply replace archaic humans, but blended with them, leading to the anatomically and genetically diverse populations we see today. Indeed, it is yet another nail in the coffin of the recent out-of-Africa theory that once envisioned Homo sapiens as a pure race that evolved in Africa without any interbreeding with Neanderthals, who have been related to a separate species based. A little-known fact is that from the 1960s until the 1980s, Neanderthals were classified as a subspecies Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, until Chris Stringer of the British Natural History Museum reclassified them as a separate species. In fact, from the 1980s to early 2000s, the out-of-Africa theory hotly contested any idea that there could be any interbreeding between modern humans and Neanderthals, and dismissed the assimilation model as fantasy. Now we know that Fred Smith was correct, and Chris Stringer was wrong, and that Neanderthals were not a separate species. Aki's research directly validates this view. I don't like to say extinction, because I think Neanderthals were largely absorbed, he noted. What once seemed like a tragic disappearance now looks more like a transformation. Neanderthals didn't vanish, they became us. They linger in our genomes, in small fragments scattered across populations from Europe to Asia to Oceania. These fragments are not evolutionary relics, they are building blocks of our present selves. The study also addressed another long-standing mystery, the population size of Neanderthals. For years, scientists estimated their breeding population at around 3,400 individuals. But Aki's team found that much of the apparent genetic diversity in Neanderthals came not from within their own group, but from modern human DNA, passed down through repeated contact. Once this external influence was accounted for, the true size of the Neanderthal population dropped to about 2,400, a dangerously small number. This makes their eventual absorption into Homo sapiens communities all the more plausible. Faced with demographic pressures and shrinking gene pools, Neanderthals may have found survival not in competition, but in cooperation and interbreeding. This demographic weakening paints a compelling image. Modern humans did not sweep across Eurasia in a sudden military campaign, but more like waves on a beach, steady, persistent, and ultimately overwhelming. Neanderthals, already vulnerable, were gradually submerged by these human tides. They became our ancestors, not by force, but by fusion. Critically, these waves of contact occurred not in deep Africa, where Neanderthals never lived, but in regions where the two species overlapped, in the Levant, the Caucasus, and Western Asia. Fossils such as those from Skul and Kafsa caves, dated to around 100,000 years ago, offer anatomical evidence of early Homo sapiens in Neanderthal territory. These individuals already exhibited traits suggesting some degree of hybrid ancestry. The genetic findings now confirm what the bones have been hinting at for decades. These were not isolated scouts, but part of long-term recurring exchanges. If the traditional out-of-Africa model is increasingly inadequate, the emerging model of early dispersal and assimilation requires a rethink not only of where we came from, but how. 
Rather than a triumphant exodus of a superior species, the true story may be one of prolonged interaction, cooperation, and gradual integration. This model embraces complexity and continuity over conquest. It acknowledges that human evolution didn't occur in a vacuum, but in a vast and dynamic theatre of shared environments, mutual adaptations, and blended identities. The implications stretch beyond the academic. They touch on how we see ourselves today. For years, the notion of human exceptionalism, our sharp divide from other hominins, has shaped not only scientific thinking, but cultural and political ideologies. Who's that guy that I brought up the other day who's a British anthropologist? His argument essentially is that human beings have been in this particular form, this homo sapien form, for somewhere in their neighborhood of 300,000 years. What these fossils tell us is that our species, Homo sapiens, is 100,000 years older than we thought. We are a third older than we realised. The new evidence suggests that we are not apart from Neanderthals, but partly Neanderthal. We are not the final product of a single evolutionary branch, but a hybrid result of many. Our genes tell stories of love and survival, of ancient meetings in cold valleys and sun-drenched plains of quiet cooperation and unrecorded unions. This is not just a new scientific model. It is a new way of imagining what it means to be human. Southwest Asia then becomes more than a bridge between continents. It becomes the first great hybrid zone, the earliest laboratory of human interaction. Here, perhaps in forests along the Zagros or in limestone caves of northern Israel, modern humans and Neanderthals lived, met and merged again and again. This region's archaeological richness is only now being matched by its genetic significance. Joshua Akey's work reminds us that models of the past must evolve with the evidence. The story of human origins is not a tale told in a single voice, but a chorus of many. The replacement model once offered a clear and heroic narrative, but it now seems far too neat for the tangled paths our ancestors walked. The assimilation model, supported by these new genetic insights, offer something richer. A vision of humanity not as a pure lineage, but as a collaboration across time and kind. And in that vision, perhaps, is the most human story of all.